next, uh, I've got a longtime friend and colleague, Dr. Al Reisner, who's going to talk to us about coronary angiography. Okay, thank you, Neil. The, uh, probably the most important development in cardiology was the uh, development of coronary angiography. This opened up the whole new world of the treatment, and that treatment uh, being initially coronary bypass surgery, subsequently uh, coronary intervention, but it all came about because of an accident. And in 1958, uh, Mason Sones at the Cleveland Clinic was doing an aortic root injection. Unbeknownst to him, that catheter had slid into the right coronary artery, and he uh, injected with a power inject uh, 30 cc's of dye into the right coronary artery. Uh, the patient became asystolic for a few minutes, ultimately resuscitated, and most people would have said, my God, I got away with the most horrible thing. He was bright enough to say, hey, this might turn into a way we can look at coronary arteries. And so several years later, uh, coronary artery, uh, coronary angiography was begun, again, from an accident. Uh, Dr. Melvin Judkins, uh, several years later, felt that he can design uh, catheters that sought out and landed in the left coronary artery and the right coronary artery. Mason Sones was pretty much a straight catheter. And this really popularized coronary angiography. It was something that almost anybody could do because the catheters uh, had the skills that people at that time did not have. Now, there are several approaches that we can use for coronary angiography. Uh, the brachial approach is not used very often. It was a basic approach initially. Femoral approach is uh, still the most popular approach. Uh, it's usually quick, it's easy. Uh, there's a choice of many preformed catheters to utilize, even in complex anatomy. And if uh, a PCI needs to be done, it's a very simple conversion to to, to do the PCI. The only patients who you can't really do this to are people, and there's a very small percentage who have pretty severe iliofemoral disease. Radial coronary angiography has uh, become uh, much uh, more popular in recent years. It still is a minority of the uh, cases. Uh, there still are skill levels that people aren't initially trained to have. Uh, but this is becoming more and more utilized. Complications of uh, coronary angiography are fairly few, uh, and it's estimated that in uh, elderly patients, about one in a thousand deaths will occur, usually based on severe underlying coronary disease. In younger patients, that statistic is even uh, more impressive and uh, no more than one in three or 5,000 uh, will succumb in the course of a coronary angiogram. Strokes occur, usually they're mistakes by the operator, uh, air in the catheter when catheters are changed, or uh, 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 clots that form on the tip of the catheter if more complicated procedures are done. And occasionally you get a dislodgement of plaque from the ascending aorta that causes a TIA uh, or a stroke. The most common complications are femoral artery complications where uh, bleeding still remains an issue, probably in about 1% of uh, patients. And then we've never been able to solve the problem of contrast-related uh, complications. The best we can come up with in uh, lessening renal uh, interference or renal failure is uh, to hydrate the patient uh, very uh, heavily, but we haven't come up with any medical antidotes to this. And then coronary artery dissection very rarely occurs with the modern catheters. Yesterday at the session in the MITE, we spent a lot of time talking about how to optimally visualize coronary uh, anatomy. And very, very simple rules of thumb shown here and discussed yesterday. Uh, 
we need in the left coronary artery to look at the left anterior descending and the circumflex systems in detail. Very simple rule of thumb is that the cranial angulations, any one of them, are optimal for looking at the anterior descending because you're looking head down on the, the coronary artery, shown on the left panel. On the right panel is a, is a caudal view, and this is most uh, beneficial for looking at the circumflex system. Variations of cranial, variations of caudal are what uh, we need to, to, to do. Now, the right coronary artery is a little simpler. Uh, generally speaking, an LAO view gives us a good image of the body of the right coronary artery. The right uh, the RAO views show us the branches of the right coronary artery. You don't see it too well on this slide right now, but uh, all the branches can be delineated. And then variations of these views are important. The remainder of the talk is more a, uh, tips and tricks on looking at uh, something that we now do almost routinely in many, a high percentage of cases, and that's looking at vein grafts and uh, internal mammary artery bypasses. So the right coronary uh, graft is best cannulated in the LAO view. The Judkins right is still the uh, traditional best catheter for it. And because the bypass often takes an inferior takeoff down to the right coronary artery, sometimes a less angled tip like a multipurpose catheter uh, might be necessary. It's very important not to forget the purpose of looking at these vein grafts, and that is to see the distal artery that the grafts are supposed to be supplying, and that's often forgotten. This is an example of the right coronary artery. You can see the inferior takeoff. Uh, very important, as I mentioned, in this case, that right coronary artery uh, diff is diffusely diseased. Uh, there's some placking in the uh, vein graft, uh, but uh, it's a vein graft supplying a very uh, uh, poor distal coronary vessel. The left coronary artery uh, bypass grafts are often more complicated because there are multiple grafts, but if you follow some very simple rules, it becomes very easy to cannulate these things. You need to know how many bypasses the patient had. And there is a hierarchy. The surgeon, uh, as Dr. Ramchandani will tell you, will never want to crisscross the bypasses. So the lowest bypass, if it's a vein graft, will be the LAD, then the diagonal, then the ramus, then obtuse marginal, and then the posterior lateral branches. Uh, rarely will this rule be violated. To get into these, use Judkins right or left coronary bypass catheter, or even an Amplatz to reach in uh, large aortas. But this is what I'm uh, uh, illustrating on the left panel is a, a CT a rendition of a patient who had triple bypass. You see the right bypass, but then you see an, a, a bypass to the LAD and a bypass to an obtuse marginal. And all you need to know is how many bypasses a patient had, and then you'll be able to find the other bypasses above or below it. But this rule of this hierarchy is almost an uh, undeniable uh, uh, and consistent rule. So here's an example of a case. This is a bypass. This patient uh, had multiple bypasses, but you get the catheter into one, and in this case, you see that it's a uh, posterior lateral branch of the circumflex. If you were looking for a diagonal or a ramus or an LAD, then you would go below this graph. So once you know where one bypass is in the left coronary system, it's very simple to find the others. Just look on the same plane and, uh, and below or above, depending on what you're looking for. Can we have the next slide, please? Now, the left internal mammary is now uh, uh, the most important bypass, as Dr. Ramchandani mentioned. Uh, 
Its uh, origin is located inferiorly in the subclavian, but also a little bit anterior. So it's not a simple matter of getting a catheter to scrape the bottom of the subclavian. You have to do some manipulation to, move, to find that anterior uh, deviation. Uh, the right coronary artery catheter is most often used but a Lima catheter is designed with a little a sharper band. It usually gets a little bit better cannulation. And then the problems with Lima are almost never in the body of the Lima, but the distal anastomosis is an issue, particularly within the first year after, coronary after bypass surgery. Next slide, please. So this is an illustration, again, a CT of a, a Lima going to an LAD, but it illustrates a view that is critical to uh, learn to use, and that is a lateral view. In this patient, uh, an LAO cranial and almost any other view fail, fails to show, and I'll show you that on the next slide, but the lateral view shows that very important distal anastomosis. Next slide, please. And this is that case with, uh, that you saw in that previous shot. And if you look at that distal anastomosis, well, let's look at uh, another view. You don't see it. You see a lemma. You see it filling the distal LAD. And you're tempted to say this is fine. It's not so fine if you look at the anastomosis in the lateral or an extreme LAO view. And that shows the nature of the site where lemurs cause problems or can have problems. Then finally, uh, there's a major limitation of coronary angiography. Um, on the left panel is a uh, uh, very severe stenosis with symmetric plaque formation. The lumen is round, and if you do an angiogram, you see that image projected, and no matter what view you look at it, you'll see the same caliber artery. And it will appear as if there's no significant stenosis in that vessel, when in fact, that artery, as illustrated here, is uh, severely narrowed. Even more common is eccentric lesions, and eccentric lesions can be misleading if you don't catch the right angle. So here's two angle, two 90-degree uh, projections of an eccentric lesion. Both would show a fairly uh, generous lumen, and yet the artery is severely narrowed. So one thing to, uh, to mention and to, uh, the lesson to leave everybody with is that coronary angiography is not angiography, it is a luminogram. And so now coronary angiography is no longer the gold standard of decision making for uh, interventions or coronary bypass surgery. And I can think of no better introduction <laughs> to the next uh, talk where we will hear some of these ways of assessing functional coronary disease.